This is a true crime podcast. It contains adult themes and content and may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. He said, you know what this is? I said, yeah, it's a razor blade. He said, I got you a mom mercy, don't you? And here, they were guards and I was a convict. And that's the way it was. You knew where you were. I wish you would just learn to behave like ladies. And uh, he said, if you draw any blood, I'll kill every man in there. So the man dropped the knife and turned to the other men that were with him that he had set loose out of the very cells and said, well, he means it. He'll kill us if we don't give up. So they gave up. You do your own number. You do your own time. If you hear something, you keep it within yourself. If you see something, you're blind to it. I don't care if it's... If it's uh, a killing or uh, whatever, you just don't see it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Behind Gray Walls, a podcast about the old Idaho State Penitentiary and the men and women who are incarcerated here. My name's Anthony, and I'm in the studio with Sky. I'm here. I'm in the studio. Woo, made oh it back goodness. to Idaho uh, just to record the finale. Just for this. I'm heading back, actually, right after we finish. It's yeah. another 24-hour drive. Oh, so my gosh. Totally well, worth it. Yeah. We'll get you some uh, Dr. Pepper. Perfect. For your, uh... <laughs> have you had the Dr. Pepper cream soda thing yet? <gasps> no. Yeah. So they have, it's like a combination, and it's Dr. Pepper and cream soda, and it is delicious. Wow. Highly recommend. Yeah. And that's our new sponsor this yes. week is Dr. Pepper. Thank you so much, Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I'm uh, solely keeping you in business. <laughs> Not really. We Not do really. have some other doctors that we're going to talk about uh, and professors and other people who are not really professionals in their own sense. But an excellent uh, segue. It was terrible. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to edit this. <laughs> I think you should keep it. <laughs> I think that you are starting today. Yes. Okay. Well, sit back, relax. Your eyelids are feeling heavy. (laughs) I don't know where this is going. Just just tell the story. Today I am talking about (laughs) Henry Herman Christopher Vilmbusey, number 852. My sources, Idaho Statesman, of course, Library of Congress, Chronicling America, the Supreme Court of Idaho, November 24th, 1902, Notes, Professor L.A. Herodin's complete male course of 20 illustrated lessons in hypnotism. A blog article by Mark Demiris called As a Means of Amusement, a short note on Professor L.A. Herodin. Rathdrum.org, the official website of the city of Rathdrum. Rathdrumhistory.com, the Rathdrum Historical Society's website. An irishcentral.com article about the naming of Rathdrum, Idaho. Very important. I'm sorry, where is this taking place? Is it Rastrum? Yeah, how'd you know? (laughs) (laughs) And a Wikipedia article on Bad Salt Zuflin, Germany, Deutschland. Deutschland. So, according to files I came across on Ancestry.com, Hermann Heinrich Christoph Wilmbusey, later known as Henry Hermann Christopher Wilmbusey, and brought into the prison as C.H.H. Wilmbusey, was born on December 25, 1851, in North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany, to Johann Friedrich Wilhelm Wilmbusey and Florentine Luisa Kaufmann Wilmbusey. Oh, so to keep it simple, I'm just going to call him Film Busey throughout this because I don't really know his first name, like his Christian-born first name. He okay. went by several, and I right. th- I think he mostly went by Henry. Well, and it sounds like he yeah. anglicized them. Right, exactly, okay. yeah. So the town he was born in was called Schutmar. It's now part of a town called Bad Salzuflen, which gets its name from an old high German meaning the salt baths in the woods, Mm -hmm. as the town has a saline spring that gives the area its nickname Germany's Healing Garden. It's near Belfelt, southeast from Hanover, and he was born on a major Christian holiday in a region known for its natural healing waters, which is a perfect start to a life filled with the belief in occult and supernatural abilities. Oh, boy. This yes. is this is going to be a story. Yeah. <laughs> so he was baptized in a German Methodist church three days after his birth, and he had an older sister named Caroline Florentine Philippine Vilmbusey, brothers named Friedrich Wilhelm Ludwig Vilmbusey, and Wilhelm Christoph Simon Vilmbusey, and a younger sister named Pauline Philippine Luisa Vilmbusey. <sighs> oh, so many letters. Many, I, many names. <laughs> it's, 
<laughs> now, so yeah. Vilne Busey with a V, or mm-hmm. is this like spelled it's with a W? W it's but with it's, a W, since yeah. it's German. Yeah, and okay. I, I really hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. It may be Vilne Buse. Uh, mm. It, I've, I've seen a couple different spellings, like incorrect spellings from newspaper articles. Okay. So I think it's kind of Vilne Buse, okay. Vilne Busey. Busey, okay. Yeah, just based on those spellings. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. His father died when he was 12, around 1863, and his mother remarried another man named Heinrich Gottlieb Siegmann. And I had a difficult time figuring out how many step-siblings he had from his mother's second marriage. He left home when he turned 20, around 1871, and his mother died three years later. It's unclear when he entered the United States, though it appears he may have traveled with some relatives of his mother, the Kaufmans. They all cross the ocean and make a new life as farmers in the United States. His exact whereabouts are unknown until his arrival in Rathdrum in 1882, and he purchased land between Coeur d'Alene and Rathdrum and developed a sizable farm. He began saving money, and by the late 1890s, he had over $800 saved in a lockbox that he buried in an undisclosed location on his land. He had a lot going for him. Uh Willem Busey, he was seen as a pretty good man in that town. Uh, He was held in high esteem. He was law-abiding. He was honest and industrious, and he had this really nice farm set out for himself with cattle and horses and obviously quite the savings account built up. Rathdrum is in Idaho's Panhandle. It's 12 miles northwest of Coeur d'Alene and 25 miles east of Spokane, Washington. It is the crossroad for State Highway 41 and 53 passing through it, linking travelers nowadays uh, traversing northern Idaho and eastern Washington. And it was considered by the Native American Salish or Flathead groups of the northwest as the Great Road of the Flatheads. Their tribal land spanned from Montana to just north of the Columbia River, which flows through Washington to Oregon. And fur trappers began passing through the area in the early 1800s, and white settlers arrived in 1861, and by the late 1860s, a Pony Express station was established in the town. It was originally called Westwood after a local rancher and land developer named Charles Wesley Wood, but authorities required them to change the name in 1881 because they had discovered that there was already another Westwood in the Idaho Territory. And a local businessman who was from Ireland recommended the name of his home village, Rathdrum, which is on the east coast of Ireland. Okay. This stuck. Everybody immediately was like, that's a great name. And that same year, Rathdrum became the county seat of Kootenai County, a title it would hold until 1908 when Coeur d'Alene would become the county seat, which it still holds today. In 1882, the year that Villembusi arrived in the town, the first Northern Pacific Rail Line was laid through Rathdrum. The county jail was erected and originally contained wooden cells, which appeared to cause some issues, according to the Rathdrum Historical Society, as the jail was extremely insecure and had a hole in the floor of the building, which someone could easily slip through. Hmm. I, when I read this, that this was just kind of common knowledge that, oh, the Rathdrum, the Cooney County Jail has a, a hole in the floor. Uh, Maybe you should just, you know... Fix it. Fix it. Fix it. Or, yeah, yeah, turn another building into the jail. Yeah, maybe not not have the jail made of wood. Yeah. Seems another option. Absolutely. (laughs) So, well, it it took him a while. In 1892, four steel cells were installed, which Willem Busey would later uh, know pretty intimately. Oh. Yeah. And in 1908, when the county seat went to Coeur d'Alene, the Rathdrum County Jail was converted into a library and then into a maintenance shop and even served as city hall at one point. And today it is a museum that you can visit during the summer and schedule private guided tours or even rent it for parties, family reunions, and so much more. So if you're in the area (laughs) and you're looking for a venue, you can contact the Rathstrom Historical Society and and rent it out. So, yeah, go support them. Now, Will Busey was a hardworking bachelor, as I said, and it seems that he was well-liked in town, but he kept to himself. He didn't have any real close friends. He had... A lot of spare time. And so around 1898, advertisements began to appear for a mail-order course to learn the secrets of hypnotism by a man named Professor L.A. Harridan from Jackson, Michigan. I found one of the advertisements that Vilm Busey probably read himself from the Seattle Post-Intelligencer in April 1898 that says, Learn hypnotism. Wonderful. Mysterious. Fascinating. Bring social and financial success. 
compels others to love and obey you, gratifies every wish. You can perform astonishing feats and make fun by the hour, cures diseases and bad habits. New and instantaneous method, quickest and best on earth, success guaranteed, cost nothing and find out all about it. I send my large, profusely illustrated lesson and full particulars free. Right today, Professor L.A. Harridan, 113 Jackson, Michigan. I'm convinced. <laughs> I think... Uh, Bad habits can be cured. I'm in. Yeah, yeah. I found my copy online for free on the Library of Congress. And guess what? I read the whole thing, and I'm a professional. And while I wait for my diploma, oh I thought I would just practice on you, Sky. This is like the palm reading all over again. A little bit. Okay. Have you ever been hypnotized? I have not. Oh, well... Oh, boy. Today's your day. Oh, so, boy. let me take off my watch here. Oh, no. <laughs> I had to do something like this in therapy. Is oh. this, are you just going to make me talk about my traumas? <laughs> I might cause trauma. I don't know. I'm okay. not sure. I've never done this. I mean, New I'm a professional. Spell. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't. Okay. So, I want you to relax in your chair. Sink into your seat. Okay. Feeling comfortable? I think so. Okay, I want you to stare at my watch. Okay. Now, I want you to keep looking at it. Right at it. And soon your eyelids will get heavy. And then heavier and heavier. Then you will close your eyes and sleep. Keep looking at it. Keep looking and pay no attention to anything but what I tell you. Do just as I ask you and nothing more. Your eyes are closing. Closing. <laughs> They're closing fast. You're almost off. They will now close entirely and you will sleep. Close them. Sleep. You cannot awaken now. Nothing will wake you and nothing will hurt you. You may even open your eyes, but you will stay fast asleep. When you wake up, you will have a toothache. A bad one. You will not remember that I suggested that you have this pain. You will from this point on go so soundly asleep that you will never remember on waking anything I said to you while you were asleep. Your memory will be a perfect blank unless I say to you during your sleep you will remember such and such a thing when you awake. Then you will remember that thing and that thing only. You will have a toothache when you awake and it will be a bad one. I shall take it away by stroking your face twice with my finger. Now I'm going to wake you by counting to three, and you will feel all right. No drowsiness will cling to you. When I count to three, you will open your eyes and wake up, and you will be wide awake. Now pay attention to me. Do you understand? All right. One, two, three. Open your eyes. Wake up. To be fair, I don't actually remember what you said <laughs> while you were telling me what I was going to remember and what I was not. I could see why holding the watch <laughs> would make you tired because you just watch the little things tick by. This definitely seems to sort of capitalize on the power of the human mind yeah. and that like you can basically make your body do almost anything Absolutely. you want it to. Yeah, so yeah. I can see why this would be interesting. Yeah. I don't have a toothache, though, yet. <laughs> though I am counting on the promise that I'm not going to be tired at all. Good. Counting on it. Good. So all if right. I get tired, right. it's not not going to work. Perfect. I just pulled the script from this book, and it's full of some of the craziest stuff. I bet. So Professor L.A. Herdon, he operated his business of selling materials on hypnotic techniques, magnetism, like we discussed in Patrick Murphy, personal magnetism, which was a huge spiritual philosophy, and mesmerism and he sent out diplomas to people after they completed this course there's no la harridan that is okay. an alias okay. and thanks to a blogger and researcher named mark tamirist who is the director of the international association for the preservation of spiritualism and occult periodicals based in <laughs> oregon which is a fascinating resource in and of itself you can actually visit his website iap 
sop.com and find hundreds of these books on this Victorian era mm. spiritualism and you know psychic philosophies and stuff. It's really cool. But Mark actually went into researching L.A. Harridan and found some newspaper articles that he posted. L.A. Harridan was in fact an alias for Stuart M. Watson, who was born in Michigan in 1871 to a farming family. Now, how did this farm boy produce this massive mail order business? He worked as an engraver at a print shop in Jackson, Michigan. And this would explain why his work is so vivid. I mean, he's got these beautiful drawings. Uh -huh. It's really fascinating. This would be really interesting to look through. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's really, really cool. Really, it's like a piece of art. Like mm. the whole thing. I read the whole thing and was super it's, entertained It's like by very it. Victorian style illustrations too. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you read this, you might think that you actually had special mm. powers. So Vilm Busey, he's this lone bachelor. He's got plenty of time to practice his patter and memorizing terms and visualizing himself putting people into this hypnotic sleep, this hypnotic state, commanding them to do whatever he wants. And the book claims that basically you can mold, shape, influence, and manipulate other people with this. It's boiled down to this line, quote, the skill of the operator consists in making the subject believe he is going to sleep. That is all. And then later, he writes that the hypnotist learns a lot about life and interpersonal relationships. He says, quote, he is learning government, learning to sway men, to influence others, and a new chapter in his life is opening. His step becomes elastic. He holds his head high. He looks by force of habit, everyone straight in the face with a clear, penetrating gaze. He feels stronger, healthier, happier. He is tasting the sweets of power conscious as he looks at his fellow men that he is in possession of the secret of all influence. It is just at this time that he begins to appreciate the power of thought alone to influence others and to practice the art of silent influence. It is a sublime consciousness which comes to a man who is vested with the power of transmitting a healing thought to the afflicted as well as the molding of those about him through the medium of his words. I mean, if I were kind of a lonely person, I was reading this and be mm -hmm. like, wow, I'd feel confident. Yeah. yeah. You I, definitely want to have like influence over people. Right. And every chapter just builds on this idea and teaches you different techniques to improve your hypnotic abilities through everyday life. And it also goes through like classic hypnotist show things like telling somebody that they're a, a dog yeah. and they're barking yeah. at the audience and stuff like that. So... There, there's some pretty fun ones. Do you think if you had been in like the audience of one of those shows that you would be like skeptical that like they just randomly picked a, per you know, quote unquote, randomly picked a person and like it's yeah. not just like some actor that they're paying to like walk around like a chicken. You know what I mean? Like, I wondered. I've been to them like at the, mm. the Ada County Fair. I went years mm. ago and I remember one guy thinking that he was invisible. He was like walking through the audience and getting really close to people. And it, it was kind of spooky. Weird. <laughs> and the hypnotist had to bring him back up on the stage, but act like he couldn't see him as well. And I don't know. It was pretty strange. And I remember in high school, our graduation, we went to Wahoos mm -hmm. and we had our big senior party and they had a hypnotist there. And my friend Brady, he went up and got hypnotized. I can't remember. I think there was like a giant spider or something that was supposed to be walking through the room. And he freaked out. He was screaming. And Did you talk to him afterwards? Yeah. And he's like, I don't know. I was hypnotized. I'm not sure. Interesting. I think that it kind of gets rid of your inhibitions so that you can kind of perform. Where a lot of people are afraid to be up on stage and to do things in front sure, of others. But sure. this hypnotist kind of gives you this power to like mm. willingly do things to create a response from an audience. Interesting. I'm skeptical. I Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've, I've never done it myself. But I think it also works with like placebo, you know. We know that if you take a sugar pill, but you think that this mm -hmm. is going to cure something, that, that will actually help you know, Im improve you. So. so everyone start taking sugar pills that you think are vaccines to COVID and you'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Don't, no, do, no, that. don't do that. Please Seriously, don't, do, don't do, do that. Do not take any medical advice from either one of us on this Seriously. podcast. Seriously. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. This book does. It goes into this concept that you can heal other people mm. through hypnotism, which is problematic. Yes. 
he's got a section that's called Cure Disease or Evil Habits. And he states that hypnotism, quote, is more wonderful than surgery, more subtle in its influence than drugs, which... Of course it would be more Mm -hmm. subtle (laughs) and permeates every part of the physical life of the patient. The person who understands hypnotism can be of untold benefit to his suffering friends and neighbors. To cure disease, you simply place your patient under hypnotic influence and suggest to him that he is feeling better, that his pain has left him, and that when he awakens, he will be in better health. Okay. So further on, he says that all diseases of the nervous system can be cured through hypnotism. Quote, briefly, the diseases in which hypnotism has proved to be a service are of the following. Hysteria, or all forms of imaginary ailments and diseases. Mm -hmm. Alcoholism, morphine and cocaine habits. Mm. Stammering, sciatica in all forms of neuralgia, sick headache, rheumatism, Vicious habits, bad temper, St. Vitus dance, epilepsy, nervous dyspepsia, constipation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love of all the things that have been on this list, that's the one that makes you laugh. <laughs> it's just <laughs> like, how does this help? Constipation. Maybe because you're like not straining. You're like, yeah, you relax. You're relaxed. Okay. <laughs> well, dysmenorrhea. Paralysis, locomotor ataxia, insomnia, chronic drains, deranged conditions of the circulation of the blood, and monomania, which is like super hyper focus, which I think some of the people who got this book, they needed to be hypnotized so that they uh, will get to that. Okay. So. I, those are all, I just love the Victorian names for all these diseases. I know. Yeah. It's yeah. So good. The whole book kind of ends with this bonus section titled Self-Treatment and Self-Healing, The Wonderful Hypnotic Methods of Curing Your Own Ailments Without Either Drugs, Doctors, Expense, or Exposure, The Grandest Blessing of Science Made Accessible to All. And it boils down to understanding that we are made up of conscious and an unconscious mind, that having faith that you will heal and even make yourself more resilient to disease, you can hypnotize yourself, essentially, to thinking that you can overcome disease, and you will. Quote, to do that, it is only necessary to keep yourself in the mental attitude of denying the power of disease to get the mastery over you. Whenever you notice the first symptoms of a coming illness, you should at once begin a vigorous course of auto-suggestion to prevent it. You will find this prevention much easier than cure. If you follow it up steadily, you will soon discover that you hold the keys to your own health in your own hands. So Willem Busey, he's reading this, he eats this up. He carries his copy with him everywhere he goes through Rathdrum. He was convinced that he had these special powers to heal. And after completing the course, L.A. Harridan sent a diploma to Willem Busey, And he decided to print up cards that read, Henry Willem Busey, professional hypnotist, cures all diseases without medicine. Word starts to spread that this crazy German bachelor in town is passing around these cards claiming these superpowers. And on August 3rd, 1899, German-born Dr. Frank Wentz of Rathdrum, who was a physician and surgeon and owned a drugstore in the town, approached Film Busey and told him to knock it off. Dr. Wentz essentially had a whole page to advertise the drugs and curative agents that he had available in the Rathdrum newspaper called The Silver Blade. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But uh, Willem Busey was seen through Rattrum acting super erratically. And he was so upset that Dr. Wentz was bothering him that he went to the sheriff, Fred Bradbury's office, and demanded that Dr. Wentz be arrested. Because, quote, he claimed he was annoying him with hypnotic talk. The paper reported that Dr. Wentz wasn't the only person Willem Busey was trying to have arrested in town at this time. Sheriff Bradbury questioned Willem Busey about his newfound claims of healing power and fixation on hypnotism. And as the sheriff listened, he became convinced that Willem Busey was not right in the mind. He arrested Willem Busey and called for the newly elected Judge John C. Brady to analyze Willem Busey. Judge Brady deemed Willem Busey insane, and he snapped. He just lost it. He was freaking out while he was in the county jail in Rathdrum. He remained locked up in the county jail until an attendant from the mental asylum in Blackfoot traveled from southern Idaho to Rathdrum to take him away. 
the asylum had 187 patients at the time, so it was pretty full. But uh, when officers examined Vilmbusi's residence after he was taken away, they discovered the diploma that L.A. Harridan had printed for him and the business cards and three loaded guns sitting around his bed. It looked like he was ready for trouble. His story appeared throughout the state with the headline, Hypnotism Turned His Brain, Henry Vilmbusi, a well-known rancher, goes to Blackfoot. So with Vilmbusi out of the way, in early August 1899, someone had to be appointed to oversee his land and stock. So Judge Brady appoints Vilmbusi's neighbor, Charles L. Sherwood, to oversee the land. And by most accounts, Sherwood was not a very good farmer himself. And while Vilmbusi was in southern Idaho, his land in north Idaho degraded, his stock was sold, and to add insult to the situation, his secret lockbox was uncovered and looted by a... <gasps> a man hired by Charles Sherwood to take care of the land. Uh So by sending Vilmbusi to the asylum, he lost everything he had built over Mm -hmm. nearly a 20-year period. That's sad. So sad. So now before we continue, I need to talk about the fact that Vilmbusi was not the only man who was deemed insane after taking hypnotism courses. Two months after he went to Blackfoot, a 36-year-old German-born Catholic priest named Father Thomas went crazy while learning about hypnotism. And this is here at Boise. Mm. And he was sent to St. Alphonsus Hospital where he remained calm for several days before just snapping, stripping naked, destroying furniture in the room, shouting with these ear-splitting yells, doing a war dance, and actually barricading himself in his hospital room. As nurses tried to peek in through the transom above the door, he was throwing chairs and and other things at them. And so they actually had to call the police and officers arrived and they held him down. They handcuffed him. He kept shouting that he was under somebody's hypnotic spell and he was deemed insane. And they said, quote, it is a case of a bright intellect being dethroned by too constant application to work without proper nourishment and rest coupled with a too morbid study of the question of hypnotism. So super similar to film you see, and he would not stop talking about hypnotism. They were like, he would be totally normal and calm and talk about religion and, and the church, and then he would just snap and just constantly talk about hypnotism, just like film was doing. Mm, interesting. In 1901, a North Idaho school teacher named Henry Ingle was judged insane after studying hypnotism, which authorities said, quote, resulted in a loss of his mental facilities. And in 1903, a couple in their 20s in Illinois ordered the Herodin course and became transfixed by the subject and practiced hypnotizing each other. They fought to exercise their willpower over each other, resulting in both falling into a state that neighbors who discovered them described as like a coma. When they were finally awoken after some serious coaxing, the wife asked to see her children, but the neighbors felt it would be too dangerous, and she freaked out. Both were actually deemed insane, and while being transferred to the courtroom to get the official charge, the wife had to be bound because she was violently thrashing about. When she took the stand, she stared with wide-open eyes, quote, that looked far into space, where she said, Since reading a lesson on hypnotism, I have lived my entire life over. The earth has been burned up, but I have saved my husband and children. The world has been purified, and we are now all saved. At times, I've been a solid rock. At others, I've been a lake of fire. I'm being treated by Professor Harridan, and as soon I will be well again. I am asleep now, but when the gong rings, I will be awakened, and the troubles of this life will be over. They were pronounced insane and taken to the asylum, and a professional hypnotist actually came in, and he introduced himself as L.A. Harridan, and the wife pledged her allegiance to him, and the hypnotist attempted to restore them, It took some coaxing, and finally the husband kind of snapped out of this hypnotic state, but the wife just suddenly died. Whoa! This is why this took me so long, because I just kept finding stories like this. There are so many more. Back to Film Museum. In early March 1900, over seven months into his time in the asylum in Blackfoot, he escapes the institution. Sheriff Bradbury received a letter from the superintendent of the asylum to be on the lookout for him. Authorities in Utah received 
telegrams as well with the note that William Busey was last seen heading south instead of north. And sure enough, officers in Ogden spotted him. They placed him under arrest and attempted to get him on the train, which is no easy task because he made a huge scene fighting the officers to get away. And he struggled with them all the way to the jailhouse, and they had to literally drag him into the jail and place him behind the bars. And after a short time, he relaxed. He told the officers that he didn't want to go back to the asylum. He would prefer to spend the rest of his days in the county jail in Ogden, then return to Idaho to the insane asylum. And he laid out this conspiracy that authorities in northern Idaho were trying to keep him in the asylum long enough that he would lose his property. Officers told reporters in the Deseret Evening News that, quote, the man seemed to be quite rational and reasonable in his talk, and from all appearances, none would think him a fit subject for an insane asylum. Regardless, Idaho authorities arrive, and they take him back to Blackfoot. He wasn't in Blackfoot long before he escaped for a second time and marched his way north, this time the 533-mile trek to Rathrum. And according to Google Maps, it would take 174 hours of walking to travel that, which, you know, if it was nonstop, it would be seven days of walking. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't figure out exactly how long it took him because they didn't report the exact date that Mm. he left. But uh, he returned to Rathrum in early June, like the first or second. Authorities said that he seemed perfectly rational in every way, but was still, quote, quite crazy. Crazy as ever he was on the subject of hypnotism. Sorry, it's like in Brooklyn Nine-Nine, crazy cupcakes. <laughs> crazy cupcakes, yes. <laughs> so Sheriff Bradbury decided that if Vilm Busey behaved himself and didn't bother anyone, he could remain in the town and take control of his land again. And so he agreed, but reported that his buried savings account had been stolen. Mm -hmm. And the neighbor, Charles Sherwood, who was supposed to be the overseer of the land, tried to help, and they pointed a finger at this young man named Ernest J. White, whom he had hired to maintain the land. It was rumored that Ernest had been flashing these large sums of money throughout the town earlier in the year, and he lost all of it gambling. Oh, no. He was tried, but there's a total lack of evidence other than rumors from folks who saw him flashing the cash. It's all gone. Uh So Charles turned over what was left of Vilm Busey's estate, which included his land, a watch, and $60 in cash. Oh, man. Vilm Busey was mad. Yeah. He had lost everything, his farm, his savings, and he told an acquaintance, Quote, he cared nothing for the property and the missing treasure, if only the occult power with which he had been possessed of and of which he was deprived of the asylum could be restored to him. His spiritual (laughs) power is gone as well. He pled with Judge Brady to restore his old life, and he tried to get a lawyer to help him, but none would because they all thought that he was crazy. He was desperate, and the hatred started to fester. And he set his sights on eliminating the people who had wronged him. Top of that list was Judge John C. Brady, who had sent him the asylum in the first place. Oh, no. So, Honorable Judge John C. Brady was born in Iowa in 1863. Just a little background. He went to the normal school in Indiana, traveled northwest to Montana, Post Falls, and ended up in Rathdrum. And he married Nettie Pine in 1893 in St. Paul, Minnesota. And the couple had two children named Arva and Elmer. Brady owned, edited, and published the official Kootenai County newspaper called The Silver Blade that I mentioned earlier that his friend Dr. Wentz advertised in. He was a prominent Democrat in Idaho, serving as the chairman of the Democratic County Central Committee and served in several fraternal organizations as well in North Idaho, and he was elected judge in Kootenai County in 1898, with Vilm Busey's case appearing early in his career. So soon after, his wife actually died in 1899 in April, and so this is pretty important here in a moment. So on the evening of July 5th, 1901, Vilm Busey walks into the office of Judge Brady at around 10.30 p.m. He asked the judge, how do you feel tonight? Judge Brady answered, pretty fair. How are you? With this, Vilm Busey pulled out a loaded revolver and said, take that into your old face Ooh, and fired. Good. The bullet entered just below his right eye and lodged itself into the base of his skull, <gasps> which fractured on impact. 
Vilm Busey put out the light in the office and ran outside. Sheriff Bradbury and his wife lived about 60 feet away in an apartment in the jailhouse. They had just laid down to sleep when they heard the gunshot and immediately bolted to the window where they saw a figure run out of Judge Brady's office and, standing on tiptoe, peek through an office window before running off. Bill Busey made his way out of town, but not without another witness as he ran past another citizen who was walking towards Brady's office after hearing the gunshot. Judge Brady was still conscious. He stood from his desk, oh my gosh. walked to his front door, and collapsed huh. out onto the front steps yeah. of his office. The citizen who had heard the gunshot who was running that way and Sheriff Bradbury and his wife ran to his aid. And early the next morning, Brady was taken to Sacred Heart Hospital in Spokane, Washington. He was in critical condition with a severe injury to his brain. And after about a week, he appeared to come too. Oh. He proclaimed to officers that Vilm Busey was his attacker and signed a deposition about what was said before the attack. His brother-in-law from Iowa came all the way to Washington and stayed by his side in the hospital. He arranged for a will to be written up in case he died, mostly concerning guardianship of his children if they became orphaned. Mm. So over the next four days, Vilm Busey traveled west, sticking to fields and forests as he trudged at night towards Washington and hid during the day. And all the while carrying several loaded revolvers and his copy of L.A. Harridan's course on hypnotism. Finally, on July 9th, an officer in Spokane, Washington, noticed Vilm Busey, who matched the description of Judge Brady's attacker. And the officer followed Vilm Busey around these busy streets, waiting to capture him in a less crowded area. Finally, Vilm Busey came to where Riverside and Sprague meet, near the Maple Street Bridge, for any Spokane listeners, when the officer made his move. He approached Vilm Busey and asked him his name. Vilm Busey backed up and reached into his pockets, and the officer took no time throwing Vilm Busey to the ground and disarming him. He was found with two loaded 32 caliber revolvers, a pamphlet titled Doctrine of the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints. All right. <laughs> that had the name and address of a local resident written on it. And, of course, a very well-worn copy of Herodin's mm, hypnotism course. Yeah. So he is brought back to the Kootenai County Jail in Rathdrum to await his trial. On July 17, 1901, at 6.20 a.m., 12 days after the shooting, Judge John C. Brady succumbs to the gunshot wound. Vilm Busey's charge goes from assault with a deadly weapon to murder. Whew. The will of Judge Brady brought on this other national story. It's heartbreaking. So, as I said earlier, his wife Nettie died in 1898, leaving him a single father with two children, a boy and a girl aged 7 and 5. He was raised Catholic, but when he married his wife... He joined the Methodist Church, which she followed. And while on his deathbed, Judge Brady promised the brother-in-law, Frank Pine, who came from Iowa, that the two children would be reared in the Methodist faith like their mother. However, while fighting to stay alive, he returned to the Catholic faith, mm -hmm. received his final rites from a Catholic priest, and executed the aforementioned will, making John C. Callahan his administrator and Father Purcell of the Catholic Church the guardian of the children. Not only that, but he had the children baptized into the Catholic faith before his death. His brother-in-law, who had traveled from Iowa to be by his side and uh, take care of the children after his death, objected to this and actually attempted to kidnap the children. Whoa. Yeah, so... <laughs> What's happening in this? <laughs> right? This is wild. So on July 17th, 1901, the day that Brady dies, quote, Judge Brady's body was hardly cold in death before his two children had been abducted and were being hurried east on a northern Pacific train by their uncle, Frank Pine of Keswick, Iowa. Father Purcell, a Catholic priest and a friend of the judge, whom the latter with his dying breath had made guardian of the children, swore out a warrant. The train was stopped at Sand Point, Idaho, and the uncle and children were taken into custody by the constable. So the family of Brady's late wife immediately attacked the will that Brady created just prior to death. And the probate court analyzed the case and agreed with her family. They deemed Judge Brady was incapacitated and mentally unqualified to write his will at the time. And I read several newspaper articles around the country about how Catholics lose a state. Victory for Protestant heirs of Judge J.C. Brady, which is so heartbreaking. Um, I mean, it's about these orphan children. And, of course, I, f I feel like that they would prefer to be with family right. over... 
dad's friends. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, religion in, in the U.S. is so fascinating. The whole situation is just so heartbreaking to me. Yeah. Uh, every aspect of this is yeah. it's a really depressing case. Yeah. Film BC, of course, he's brought up for trial and he pleads not guilty. Several organizations call for him to be hanged regardless of his sanity, Whoa. which is pretty wild. This is someone who's been sent to Blackfoot twice. A month after Brady's shooting, a man named William Steffen, who was deemed insane in Moscow, he actually snapped and shot and killed a doctor and a sheriff before killing himself. This attack was unprovoked, and public opinion was shifting to the idea that authorities were being too lenient towards the mentally unstable. And so capital punishment was now on the table. Like, people were saying, like, wow. If this guy's going to be criminally insane and injure other people, maybe he shouldn't be allowed to live. Wow. Film BC was having a difficult time finding lawyers to defend him until finally attorney R.E. McFarlane of Coral Lane was hired. And he came up, and much of the trial was about the sanity of Film BC. And the superintendent of the Blackfoot Asylum testified on his behalf that he was insane Though the prosecution brought out that during his stay in the asylum, Villeneuve had a pretty clear grasp of what was right and wrong. So Dr. Wentz also took the stand against Villeneuve to show evidence that he was sane enough to ask Brady how he was doing before the shooting. Mm -hmm. Quote, Dr. Givens testified on the witness stand that Villeneuve was insane, but was capable of knowing right and wrong that he had homicidal mania and was inclined to be murderous, provided he took a notion he was being wronged or injured. So he's trying to go against what the superintendent from the asylum was saying. Originally, the jury had two decisions, murder in the first degree, which could mean capital punishment or life in prison, or acquittal, and Villeneuve would be sent to Blackfoot. Mm. During the jury deliberations, one stood for an acquittal while the other 11 actually called for a conviction. They finally agreed to compromise. Henry Herman Christopher Vilmusi was guilty of murder in the second degree, mm. which carried a possible sentence of 10 years to life in the penitentiary. On December 30th, 1901, five days after his 50th birthday, Vilmusi was brought back to the court for sentencing, and the judge asked him if he had anything to say why sentencing should not be passed upon him. And he stood and made a lengthy speech justifying the act, though he never admitted to it. He said that attempts had been made to hold him up and rob him of his property. He wanted to know why he never got justice. He then threatened his lawyer, the prosecuting attorney, and finally the judge. The Coeur d'Alene Press noted, quote, His talk was rambling and convinced many of his hearers that he should be sent to an insane asylum instead of the penitentiary. When he finally finished, the judge sentenced Villeneuve to natural life in prison at the Idaho State Penitentiary, and he was picked up by a traveling guard and arrived at the penitentiary on January 25th, 1902. His intake, name C.H.H. Villeneuve, number 852, county, Kootenai, crime, murder in the second degree, sentenced life, age when received, 50, born in Germany, legitimate occupation, farmer and baker, height, Five feet four and a quarter inches tall, so that kind of explains him standing on his tiptoes, mm. peeking in. Complexion, dark. Weight, 155 pounds. Color of hair, dark brown or black. Color of eyes, gray. He was single. His father had died when he was 12. Mother, when he was 23. He left home when he was 20. His religious instruction as a Methodist, attended Sunday school, but wasn't a member of any church upon incarceration. He had a common school education and attended school 14 years. He was a moderate drinker. Former imprisonment was in the asylum. Name and address of the nearest relative, Fred Kaufman in Pittsfield, Illinois, is, is probably his uncle or cousins. Condition of teeth, good, full beard worn, size 7 boot, property on convict. I believe it says a Belgian watch with initials on it. His Bertillion card revealed scars on the back of his neck and his left hand several on his face, his knees, and his right shin, and he was missing his right pointer finger from the second joint. Well, Yeah. So, Willem Busey spent a very long time in prison. He would ultimately see the construction of number two and number three house, the executions of five of the ten men hanged at the oh. site, the establishment of the shirt factory, the publishing of Patrick Murphy's book Behind Gray Walls, and 
Thousands of men come and go while he remained within the confines of the prison. He appealed to the Supreme Court, but they concurred with the original hearing. His file is full of letters, many of which never made it past the prison censors, who thoroughly read every letter coming and going from the prison. Some were written in Old High German, which is indecipherable without a specialist in the German language. Hmm. Um, the alphabet is completely different from our system, and I actually attempted to have it translated several times, but I couldn't afford the fee because it would cost me probably about $100 for a four-page letter wow. to be translated, which... <sighs> If you want to support this podcast, you can visit our do- <laughs> donate, <laughs> and I can have this old letter deciphered. Actually, they were redacted because prison policy required that all letters coming and going from the prison be written in English. Right. There are a couple that are written in Old High German that he actually wrote a translation to in little huh. notes. Yeah, so I tried to use that as mm-hmm. a basis. Mm-hmm. Oh, my years of German in high school, they just are not <laughs> translating now. His letters that are in English, they're riddled with these mm. r- really strange spelling errors and strange word choices. So in the following quotes, like I tried my best. I tried to edit it down to, to something that makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. So in January 1919, Villambusi wrote a six-page letter to the pardon board trying to reintroduce himself to the board because he felt, quote, I have been forgotten or overlooked entirely as I am in this pen, longer than any other man. He says that he was sent to the asylum in August 1899 and sent to Blackfoot Asylum, quote, until they got done with me and my nicely fitted out farm and stock and money, and only by deserting I had the chance to see the robbery they worked on me, and I had to go on foot on the roads where I used to drive my own stock and wagon. And he said that Judge Brady and others had a conspiracy to steal everything from him. And he was heartbroken as he had been a hard worker his whole life to create this farm and raise the stock himself only to be deemed insane and sent away so that others could swoop in and steal his belongings. I mean, yeah, Yeah. I think there's, there's a point to it. Yeah. In April, 1919, his attorney McFarlane wrote to the governor, which would, I mean, this letter would condemn film you see to life in prison. He said, quote, I certainly do not want to see that man, Villambusi, paroled or pardoned. I'm sure that were he given a parole or pardon, he would kill somebody within a month thereafter. He also wrote a more detailed letter to the warden breaking down the history of Villambusi in the asylum and his connection to the town. He said, quote, after shooting Brady, he lingered around town for the purpose of shooting several others who had been instrumental in having him committed to the asylum. Now, of course, Villambusi had no luck in this because the attorney also wrote, quote, I was satisfied when I went to defend him that he was insane. Although he insisted absolutely and persistently that I should not put in a plea of insanity and threatened that if I did so, he would denounce me in open court and would reject my defense of him. After he was found guilty, he made the statement to me and to others that if the authorities would only give him freedom for three hours, he would be willing to hang and mention the fact that there were three or four others in Rathdrum whom he would kill. Among them were C.L. Heitman, Dr. Wentz, Edwin McBee, Fred Bradbury, and the rancher who had been appointed his guardian while he was in the asylum, Charles Sherwood. He also accused me of clandestinely putting in the plea of insanity and thus betraying him, and since he has been in the penitentiary. He has written me a number of letters threatening to kill me should he ever obtain his freedom. His threats preyed so upon the mind of his guardian that 10 or 12 years ago, he left this country and went to California, where through fear of Vilmbusi, he committed suicide. I have defended 23 murder cases in my time, and I believe that Vilmbusi is the most dangerous man whom I have ever defended for murder. Ordinarily, He is apparently an easygoing, harmless fellow, but he possesses a great amount of cunning. I am satisfied that should he be paroled or pardoned, he would not be out of the penitentiary four weeks before he would kill someone. In fact, I would feel in great fear for the safety of myself and family should he be paroled or pardoned, and I certainly should oppose any application that he may make for either parole or pardon. Every time that Film Busey would attempt to apply for a parole or pardon. 
this letter would pop up in mm-hmm. front of the parole board. Mm-hmm. And I decided to investigate what happened to Charles Sherwood, the guy who was set to oversee his land. During the trial, Sherwood ran into some issues. This is back in 1901, while mm-hmm. while Van Busey is, is going through his trial. His family gets this severe flu. His best horse dies due to colic. And by 1902, he had to auction off hundreds of acres of land. He ended up moving to Santa Rosa, California, where it seems Film Busey was still haunting him. He received threatening letters, and on September 12, 1903, he decided to end his own life. So listeners, please skip ahead if you don't want to hear these details. While his wife and older children went into town, Charles told his young son to go outside and fetch the mail, and the mailbox was quite a ways from the house. Alone in the house, he sat in his chair in a bedroom and penned several notes to his new neighbors, thanking them for their kindness, his children telling them to lead good lives and become upright citizens, and his wife telling her how much he loved her, concluding, Till we meet in heaven. Charles, sitting in his chair, laid the butt of the loaded shotgun on the ground, the muzzle pointed at his chest. He pulled the trigger with his foot. His son returned from the mailbox and found his father, and he ran to the neighbors for help, but it was too late. Neighbors stated that he had been despondent for some time prior to committing suicide. I remember when I first studied Villembusi's case, I thought that this prosecuting attorney was making this up. Mm. And then when I found the newspaper articles like detailing this, this is another victim of his, like... Man, and then the constant strain from from all these other men that were listed, the the sheriff, you mm-hmm. know, these other attorneys that that were in fear of that if he was ever released, he might come and and get them. And I'm kind of convinced that it was probably best that he stayed in prison the rest of his life. But I mean, his letters are pitiful. So he wrote another letter to the governor in March 1920, breaking down what he thought was a complete injustice. He said, "Quote." I am the man who fell victim of a conspiracy at Rathdrum in August 1899 and railroaded me into the institution to rob me of all I had. I was a peaceable, law-abiding citizen and self-supporting and self-employing man and persecuted me whenever I went fleeing from them. The man met me in Spokane, Washington, where he said, Go where you will. I can get you arrested. I work for my living while he had my property and my money in his possession. Who is that man that denies and defies me my liberty in free and good ways? And what law, if any, to arrest any self-supporting man and railroad him from one institution to another? And he compares what I believe is the word pirate, spelled P-I-R-A-T. He writes that so many times (laughs) throughout these letters, saying that they were pirates that they had stolen Mm -hmm, from him. mm -hmm. And the most important part of the letter is, is the sentence, quote, Governor Davis, about 2,000 man has come to this place and gone again, convicted of any kind of sentence since I came here. Now, please tell me the truth and the reason why can't I leave this pen? And that is a serious question. Like he continues on a third sheet of paper saying that the crime was committed on him. Quote, in this 20 years crime school, I have learned very much of rottening rot I never knew before, which I really did like that. Rottening rot. rot. Rottening rot is good. Yeah. In July 1925, Vilm Busey wrote to the governor and pardon board with a fiery letter asking why he had not been released. Quote, I'm the most wrong man you hold in your prison. Law may be law, but justice is another thing. I have fought for law and justice, but could not find it nowhere. I could tell you much more of what has done on me, wronged, and further down. Now, I would like to know of you, Governor, head of the state people. Must I stay in here, suffering the wrongs of others for others? Also, is right wrong? Is wrong right? Please do not take this for an assault. For law, love, justice, and mercy has been my humble existence. So in December 1925, Around his birthday, Villembusi writes a letter to a dentist who had visited him and removed some of his teeth. And he says, quote, I am the man with the whiskers you may remember, which is one of my favorite things he wrote. And he talks about how he was getting old and he was finding it difficult to eat, but he didn't have the funds to buy a new set of teeth. And he says, quote, I would like very much to get a birthday and Christmas present. Oh. I hope you are well to do and pity one old man. 
And I don't think that this letter actually even made it to the dentist. I mm. think it was censored. So I don't think he ever got, got a present. his teeth for, for Christmas. Sad. All he wanted for Christmas were his false teeth. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. Around 1930, he wrote a letter to the board asking for a pardon again. And he said, quote, I have asked and prayed again and again for pardon, but no mercy was ever shown me. He's been in the prison since 1901. So nearly 30 years now. Governor Baldridge told me he had read my letter carefully and had filed it away for future reference, but always forgotten. I am too poor to come before the board so often and no results. I cannot say anything regarding myself at this time or any other, as I have told all I know, and it seems that I cannot tell or say what you would like to hear in order to give me back my liberty from this prison. I know of no enemies unless it is someone unknown to me who would plot up a game to get me down to this life in prison. I am honest with every man I knew or dealt with. Therefore, I ask and pray that the pardon board kindly give me my freedom." respectfully chh film you see and then in quotes it says for free way and days and i try to figure out if that was like a spiritualist thing Mm. this is you know Mm. patrick murphy had already published both versions of behind gray walls harry orchard had been in there for about 25 years five years less in July 1931, Bill Busey's application for pardon is denied mm. for the last time. Finally, after spending just under 36 years in the institution, Bill Busey dies at the age of 86 on January 8th, 1938. He was the, quote, prison's oldest inmate both in age and in years of confinement mm. at the time. And this would be replaced by Harry Orchard, who would spend 10 more years in the institution than Bill Busey. Mm. His death certificate said he died from a cerebral hemorrhage with general senility as a contributing cause of death. And in an article about his death in the Iowa Statesman, it included a note from a prison official who asked Phil Busey late in life what he would do if he was released. And he answered, quote, I'd go out and kill me another judge. Okay. So, buddy. <sighs> right. Listen. Yeah. Can't. There's a reason that they didn't let you out. And it sounds like... They were justified in it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, we see it all the time. Spite yeah. kind of equals longevity in a yeah. lot of ways. I think, man, had he given up, he may not have lived to be 86. You know, spending so long in prison. Uh, not long after, a letter actually arrived from his family, the Kaufmans, and they said, thank you very much for letting us know the death of our beloved uncle. We were glad he did not have to suffer very much before he died. And the Lord took care of him, so he did not suffer long. He may have been writing them this whole time, Mm. and we just don't have his letters. Right. Despite his family reaching out, no money was sent for a proper burial. Film Busey was buried in the prison cemetery. The letters on his gravestone have washed away with time, but fortunately, a map was drawn up of the cemetery grounds before the letters disappeared. So we know the location of his final resting place. That is the long, kind of depressing life of a man who came from Germany to start building a ranch only to get it taken away when he crossed paths with a hypnotism course that he saw in a newspaper that promised that he could cure everybody's disease and all the wrong in the world through hypnotism. This would be his downfall. Wow. Yeah. That's that's a lot. That is a this is a season ender for yes. sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Take medical advice from people who have spent their lives dedicating their lives right. to understanding medicine. Right. There's a reason that a lot more people are living a lot longer, and it's because we have made so many huge gains in Western medicine. Doctors know what they're talking about, for yeah. the most part. So just be a little skeptical <laughs> of all the things that you read. Oh. Do your research. Hello, listeners. This is the season finale, which means Sky and I will be taking a brief break while we plan out and record a brand new themed season. Should we tell them what it's all about? Hmm, not yet. But don't worry, you can get your old pen fix by visiting the site in the coming weeks. We will be hosting Make Hunger History June 5th through June 8th. For the price of five cans of food and a $5 bill, you will be able to drive through the historic Sallyport in the prison yard, a real drive-by history. 
We will return to normal operation the following weekend with hourly admission starting at 10 a.m. on June 13th. Visit our website, history.idaho.gov, to learn more and to purchase your admission tickets. Online registration is highly recommended. And Anthony and I are looking forward to seeing you then. All right, Sky. What do you have for us today? So I um, have got a pretty, pretty infamous lady, uh, number 8760, Lena Pink Proud. Um, now, this is this does deal with abortion, which I know is a very hot-button topic, and so obviously I'm not here to get into my political opinion on it or anyone's political opinion on it, but this, you know, it, it is an issue that comes up. So I think just, it's a great example yeah. of mm-hmm. the legality yes. of, of abortion. Yeah. I am going to talk about sort of the, the history. I mean, not a ton of history about it, but just sort of like what I've learned through my studies. But I, I hopefully will not get too political either way. My sources are her inmate file, trial manuscripts, and pieces of evidence from the Idaho State Archives, which I got thanks to Anthony, Idaho Daily Statesman articles, Ancestry.com, CityofHomedale.org, and then I used Wikipedia. I looked at Owyhee County. I was actually going to get into the history of that, but there's another inmate from the same place, so I'm actually going to do Owyhee County with her later. And then a National Geographic article titled Basque Culture in the Idaho Towns of Ketchum, Boise, and Haley by Alex Schechter. So Lena Pink Proud was born Lena Pink Wilson, which I think Pink is an interesting middle name. And I'm not not sure why, because I don't think that was her mother's maiden name or anything. Maybe it was a family name way back. So Lena Pink Wilson, she was born January 16th, 1888 in Napa, California. Her parents were J.H. He also went by Henry. And Rachel, who also went by Nettie. And Lena was the third of 10 children. And some went by their middle name, which was kind of interesting and also kind of confusing. So she had two older sisters, Cora and Rose June. And then her younger sisters, she had a brother, Marion. Sisters Daisy, Phoebe Maud, Ida, Ruby. And then two youngest brothers, Fred and Joe. Fred died in 1921 of a ruptured appendix when he was 19 years old. And then Cora died in 1948 from a heart ailment. Now, the whole family seemed to suffer from heart problems, and, and Lena herself also suffers from them. And then Phoebe Maud died in June 1952 um, of an unknown reason. So by the time we kind of get to Lena, with her time at the penitentiary, she's lost both of her parents. She's mm-hmm. lost some siblings. and But her life growing up was... Was, was fairly nice. Um, she and her siblings got along quite well. She was particularly close with Ruby, who was about 10 years younger than she was. Her father held various jobs. He was a school teacher, a surveyor, a county assessor, a railroad telegrapher, a well driller, a homesteader, and a general laborer. And so because of this, Lena recalls growing up in various places around the country. So they were always moving. They grew up in poverty, but she remembered that her parents were kind and affectionate towards the children. She remembered receiving only one punishment. She got spanked when she was four years old for swearing. But she said that her parents were really not harsh at all. She actually said that they had kind of like a pioneer lifestyle, that they were, you know, all the kids sort of pitched in with help around you know the farm or just around the house and you know they just had to sort of make do with what little money they had and luckily there were enough kids that they all played together and Mm -hmm. and they were kind parents so you know her childhood really was was quite good she did say that the family moved around just a bit too much for either she or her siblings to have a full education she thinks that she finished the eighth grade at washington county grade school in gooding idaho But the school wasn't there by the time she came in, and so they couldn't get records from that. Her parents were Baptist. They actually mostly had services in their house just as a family. But when they could, they would go into town and and have actual services. With such a large family and such a tough economic situation, she was forced to start working at a pretty young age, which is probably why she, at the most, got an eighth grade education. And basically, if you name it, she pretty much did it. She was a babysitter, which is pretty normal. She was a housekeeper, a cook, a boarder, a seamstress. She was a freight team driver. 
she even did some practical nursing for those who could not afford the doctor. Doctors about then usually cost about $10. Now, obviously for us, that's not a big deal, but remember $10 in the first half of the 20th century is around $100. So it was not cheap to go to the doctor and especially in these rural areas, if you have the the housewife, if you house, you know, houses down or, you know, a, a farmer who has some sort of medical experience, then they sort of make do. And so keep this nursing experience in mind for the future. And Lena claims that when she was about 15 and a half years old, around 1903, she says that she ran away from home and she had been on her own ever since then. I think that they were in Oregon at the time that she ran away. And so she kind of was around different places and ended up in Idaho, which is not unusual. So on August 17th, 1905, Lena married Oscar J. Pinkston in Boise, Idaho. She did say it was Idaho City in 1903, but the record I found was in Boise. And I do think it's interesting that her first husband's last name is Pinkston, but I, I think Pink was has always been her middle name, so it was just a coincidence. After they got married in Boise, the couple moved to Caldwell in Canyon County, and they had two children, Pearl, born in 1907, and Opal, born in 1910. Now, Oscar was a bit of a religious fanatic and attended several different churches without committing to one. And Lena claims that he went insane several times and actually spent time in a mental institution. And and this insanity had to do with really how fanatic he was about religion and how sort of he couldn't keep his attention on one thing. And he just, I mean, we all kind of know that religious fanatic that they just are a little, a little much. Yeah, totally. And so they divorced sometime in the 1920s. There's actually several different dates that she gives. She gives 1920, 1924, 1925. I think sort of based on the series of events, I think 1924 is the most accurate year that they got divorced because on August 17th, 1925, so 20 years to the day after her first marriage, she married a man named Sid Skinner in Boise. Sid was between 12 and 14 years older than she was. He was a sheep man who owned a ranch in Diamond, Oregon. But from the beginning, their marriage was quite strained. He wanted to marry Opal, which was her second daughter, um, who was only about 15 at the time. He wanted to marry Opal off to a man who was Lena's age, which Lena obviously was like, oh, no, that's she's 15. And and yeah. she would have been almost 40. And, yeah. you know, her daughter's 15. And uh, Sid was also an excessive drinker. And he really got in violent states when he was drunk, which is very common, unfortunately. And so when she straight up said, you're not marrying my daughter to this man, he made a huge fuss, was really upset about it. And she said that she thought more of her children than she did of him. And she left him, which I think is, is a kind of a really bold way to say it, that she thought more of her children than she felt of him good for her i think yeah you know that she put her her children's well-being above above her her marriages mm-hmm. really it didn't say what year that she left him but i it didn't sound like they were married for too long mm-hmm. And around April or May of 1931, she started living with a man named Jesse Proud. They were married. It was a common law marriage. They never formally got married. So they lived on a homestead just outside of Homedale, Idaho, at a place called Poison Creek Station. She says they intended to get formally married, but she was afraid of having another marriage go badly, and they, quote, just put it off. Mm -hmm. Jess, or Jesse, was a farmer. He was about 10 years older than Lena was. He owned a house. He had two lots. He had the property at Poison Creek Station, and he also had a farm in Homedale. So he's doing pretty well for himself. And she said that Jesse was the only man she ever really loved. In 1940, the couple adopted a daughter named Carrie. They had adopted her five days after her birth from Salvation Army in Boise, and they had heard that the girl's real mother had actually died when Carrie was about two. Mm. So they have this adopted daughter who's much younger than her other children, but kind of gives them something to do. And throughout her life, and especially living with Jess, Lena loved to take care of children, especially whose mothers were ill or were working. She preferred to take care of children in her own home so that she could do her own housework, but she was happy to help out if they needed help. Her sister Ruby said that she only wanted to help unfortunate people. She was always feeding the poor, caring for the sick. 
So her sister Ruby said that she only wanted to help unfortunate people. She was always feeding the poor and caring for the sick. And Ruby also said that there was an accident that had happened several years before 1953 when a mower went out of control. And apparently, while everyone just sat and watched this mower just, like, go out of control, Lena sprang to action and essentially sacrificed her arm to a mower to protect this child. I think it feels a bit exaggerated. Yeah. But I think the sentiment still stands that overall she is a good Samaritan. She just wanted to help care for other people. Mm-hmm. But she did suffer from numerous health problems herself. In 1934, she'd had all of her teeth extracted. And so she just had false teeth. In 1938, she was in a major car accident and had her right knee crushed. And as a result, her right leg was about half an inch shorter than her left leg. So I think she walked with just the tiniest bit of a limp. And then she also suffered from arthritis. All joints in her hands were swollen and stiff. And again, keep this in mind for a little bit later. But despite all of these numerous health problems, she created a good reputation for herself um, and for helping others in her home in Homedale. Mm -hmm. So let's pause for just a moment and talk about Homedale a little bit. How much do you know about Homedale? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I didn't know much at all. So Homedale is in west central Idaho. It's about six miles from the Oregon border and about 40 miles directly west of Boise. It is the largest city in Owyhee County. Now, the area, as we've always talked about, was first occupied by Shoshone Paiute tribes before any white settlers. The first white settler was in 1898 with a man named Jacob Mussel, and he built a ferry to help people cross the Snake River. Then 11 years later, in 1909, a town site was platted, and a mayor and council was elected, and the name was literally picked by picking a name out of a hat. (laughs) So they had like a picnic and they like, okay, put all your name suggestions in. We're just going to pick one at random. And they reached in and they pulled out Homedale. And that's why it's called Homedale. Oh, I like it. It's kind of, kind of quaint. It's like a, it's very like small town, (laughs) which is cute. I I like it. In 1913, there was a two-story brick schoolhouse built, and that same year, the Union Pacific Railroad built a line connecting Homedale, Idaho to Nyssa, Oregon, which is about, Nyssa is about 20 miles north. And so this railroad, along with irrigation from the Snake River, turned Homedale and Owyhee County into productive agricultural regions. Homedale produces alfalfa seeds, sugar beets, potatoes, corn, grain, hops, and even a bounty of wine grapes. So fans of local alcohol, you may have Homedale to thank. You know, I think I've actually traveled through the hop fields Mm -hmm. of Homedale. There's this thing called the Mary Hopsters, this Mm -hmm. like bus tour. Mm -hmm. And I did it a couple of years ago. It was so much fun. Hops are so great. Yeah. So my uncle is involved in in local brewing and I don't know where he gets his hops. But, you know, local, if we're, you know, looking for local alcohol, maybe give a shout out to Homedale next time you take a drink from a local local brew. (laughs) In 1920, Homedale is officially established as a town, and there are two major cultural influences in the community in Homedale. The first are the Basque, and the second are the Austrian, which I didn't know about the Austrians. Wow. So Basque is pretty common in Idaho, and especially in the, the southern part of it. So for those of you who don't know, the Basques are an ethnic group of peoples from a region of the Pyrenees Mountains between southwest France and northwest Spain. Now, the Basque were initially drawn to Idaho for silver mining, but they settled in the mountains of Idaho because of sheep herding, for which the Basque are, quote, indispensable. That's what the Basque did the best in the Basque region. And so American owners were practically begging for Basque sheep herders to bring other family members because they were so good at what they did. Mm. And so the Basque culture is, quote, one of exceptional warmth, inclusivity, and cheer. And for those of us who grew up in the Boise area, likely know a lot of Basque people, we know that that's true. I, I'm not Basque in any way, but I love to go down to the, the Basque block that we have mm-hmm. in Boise. I haven't been to High Aldi yet, but I oh, really, yeah. really want to go to High Aldi. Basque Festival. Yeah, I had a, a girl on my soccer team. She was a, a Basque dancer. And it just looks fun. Like, they yeah. just look like they're having a good time. And they they enjoy just, like, being together. Yeah. Which is great. 
Idaho has one of the largest Basque populations in the United States with about 15,000. That number 15,000 is according to that National Geographic article that I talked about. Wikipedia says about 8,000. Mm. We actually, I learned this, that we don't have the largest Basque population in terms of numbers, but we have the largest concentration of Basque, that we have more Basque per capita yeah. than I think Los Angeles had kind of the, the next, the, the largest in number, mm. but they weren't as concentrated as they are here. Homedale also has a large Austrian population because around 1914, there were unscrupulous land speculators who went to Austria and they quote unquote sold a group of Austrians land just outside of Homedale. And the Austrians said, wow, that's so great. We have land. And so they move here. When they get to Idaho, they found out that the land was undeveloped. It, they had promised that it would be developed and they had to repurchase the land from the government. Oh. So they just straight up gave money to just these dudes who... <sighs> Didn't I mean there was there must not have been a deed or anything again research seriously research which I mean it was 1914 <laughs> that also that's right when World War One started yeah. so they're desperate to get out of Europe mm -hmm. so they definitely got burned but they decided to st I mean you spent all this money you are out of the center of the war so you're not going to go back mm -hmm. so you're going to repurchase the land and <sighs> you're going to settle and so they did and the area that they settled is still known as austrian town just outside of homedale wow. and so in 1921 homedale had the very first bridge that spanned the snake river and so the town continued to grow the population in 2010 was about 2,633. The 2018 estimate is 2,675. Mm. So they're remaining pretty steady. I think the the population that live out there kind of do tend to all do sort of what their family did. And it's a very, I think it's a very tight knit community. Mm. And in 1950, around the time that Lena was living there, the population was about 1,411. So it's a, it's a pretty small town, but homey you know it's called homedale for a reason so back to lena lena kept a book wherein she wrote names and what i think are money amounts that she collected from them so there's a ledger she would just write their name and then there would be numbers mm -hmm. it didn't necessarily say like what it was for it probably relates to sort of her nursing and a little bit of work she did as a midwife but the names were men as well as women yeah um yeah i think a lot of it was like room and board because okay, she had a little right. boarding she room a... she, she would make dinner and, and soups mm. and things and feed the men that were passing through and also feed their horses mm. so so some of those fees kind of related to her feeding hay to the horses right. and okay. stuff yeah this notebook is huge though it has at least it 280 is. pages and Lena was also quite interested in astrology. She had several astrology charts handwritten into her notebooks. I don't know what any of it means. It's all Greek to me. And they were all different. So she would sort of have, I guess, like almost like two dials. And she would sort of, I think some of them had to do with the women that she helped, which she would basically would like look at their horoscope and determine something from that i'm i'm again i i know absolutely nothing about astrology except that i'm a cancer and that like the personality traits of a cancer are very much me um <laughs> but that's all i know <laughs> so also in evidence against lena was a diary that was begun on january 1st 1952 and this diary was crucial to her case now, she just had pages and pages and pages of a town name followed by a number. So some examples, there was Freewater 37, Houston 66, CUNA 18, and then there were other pages with more detail. So for example, Boise 48 had very high fear, was tense, fairly good, and then later she penned in January 3rd, still no, no, very tense, hard to help. And then February 6th, doing good, tense, but not bad. There was a note that said re r e e i couldn't read it but it's like re out comma sore it's practically illegible because mm -hmm. these are notes that she's keeping for herself she knows what they mean yeah. but if someone like us or someone like the police were to stumble right. upon it they would have no idea right. you know you can you have ideas of what it might be but mm -hmm. since she's not writing down exact details yeah. you can't use that as you know this for sure means this mm -hmm. She had other notes that are likely coded. They don't really make much sense. On one of the notes she had, there was one that read greed. So I don't know if this person was really greedy and like yeah. didn't want to give up the money or, but I, you know, I don't, I don't know. This was all important to Lena. So another example, there was Nampa 98. On February 9th, it says V, just right. 
the letter C, high, close 77 to 87, no trouble, good. Mm. So if this doesn't make sense to you, then welcome to the club. If it doesn't make sense to me either. <laughs> you Again, we can only speculate what like V might stand for or what those numbers might stand for. Yeah. You know, we don't know. Then within the diary, there were also loose scraps of paper with some other very important details. So for example, Eagle 81 on February 14th was tall, light brown hair, brown eyes. She was tall, apparently very tall because she noted it twice. <laughs> Um, Winnemucca 83 had light red hair, light eyes, tall, tan, had to be worked by nine o'clock. There was an unidentified person who had dark red hair, tall, beautiful, brown eyes, brown shoes, blue shirt, peach coat. So clearly these are, you know, identifying, you know, markers. And all of these code names and details likely point to the rumors that Lena ran, quote, an abortion mill in Homedale. So again, I'm not here to dig into the morality or the political aspects of abortion. Instead, I just want people to understand the reality of abortion for women in the early to mid 20th century. Most women did not have nearly as much control over the size of their families as we do now, especially before the advent of the birth control pill, which did not come until the 1960s. So in rural areas, and even even after the birth control, in rural areas, like most of Idaho, large families, they could help out on the farm, but large families could also be a drain on finances. And so it was sort of a catch-22 that a lot of these families were in, that you wanted to have lots of kids, but lots of kids also meant lots of money. And so... Though this is perhaps a bit of an overgeneralization, I would guess that many women in Lena's area were seeking abortion simply because they could not afford to have another baby in the house. And again, I'm not here to say that that's good or that's bad. You have your opinions on it, I'm sure. But this is likely much of who were seeking Lena out to to perform these for them. I've also learned in my studies that many women relied on other women with nursing or medical experience to provide abortions because going to the doctors was too expensive and not to mention illegal. Mm -hmm. And so women also just turn to other women for, you know, other reproductive advice, for family raising advice. In the 1940s, there was a big push because women were so crucial to other women that doctors had to start saying, like, listen to us as doctors. Like, we know what we're talking about, but still... You know, if a doctor costs a hundred dollars to go to, and then your mom knows someone, you know, has a friend who, you know, dealt with your baby with colic, you're just going to go to that friend. You know, right. this is definitely sort of the situation that a lot of these rural women are in. And so often, you know, anyone involved in the abortion from those who performed it to those who had it performed on them or even those who had any knowledge of it could be prosecuted as criminals. Abortion prior to the 1970s with the court case Roe v. Wade, abortion was dangerous. I mean, because most abortions were performed outside of medical grade institutions, infections, infertility, and even death could be results of home abortions. And again, I'm not here to justify the actions of anyone involved, but I just think we need to have a more complete understanding of the historical realities of abortion around this time. This is not an easy situation for anyone involved, from the person who needed it to the person who did it. There were major risks involved in all parties. So with that in mind, on February 27th, 1952, two women arrive in Homedale, Darlene Pig and Viola Lucart. They arrive in Homedale from Boise. They acquire around town about where Lena Proud lived and was directed to her house. Now, one was attempting to get an abortion. The other was there as sort of moral support and to help her out when they left. And I don't want to say like who was who. I just, you know, say their names at the top. And, you know, because I, you know, this was a private thing for them and, and they got caught. And so that's, you know, the only reason that we sort of know who they are. Mm-hmm. But for their privacy, I just will refer to them as they are referred to in Lena's appeal. So kind of spoiler alert, but Lena will eventually appeal her conviction. Uh, one of them is the victim and the other is the accomplice. Mm-hmm. So Lena meets these two women on the porch and they chat a little bit before Lena lets them into the house. And the house was a simple one story house. So there's a map that's actually included. And so it basically just imagine like a long rectangle. So on the southwest corner is a bedroom. On the southeast is the living room. And then the northwest is another bedroom. 
and on the northeast is the kitchen and a bathroom. So the bedroom on the northwest is the bedroom in question. So Lena leads these two women back to this bedroom. There is a bed that is on the west wall. And so Lena asks the victim to sit on the bed. And then Lena washes her hands in a large bowl and, quote, proceeded with the use of something she held in her hand, covered by a wash rag, to perform the operation, giving the victim certain instructions in connection therewith at the time. And this is uh, continuing to quote, a few minutes later, appellant told the victim, an appellant is uh, Lena in this case, appellant told the victim she might sit up, then admonished her she might have cramps and feel a gush of water on the way home. Immediately thereafter, the accomplice paid the appellant $10, the money belonging to the victim. Appellant then took a diary book out of the dresser drawer, gave the victim a pencil and envelope, and informed her she would give her a number to write down, and directed the victim to send the envelope and number back to appellant when the victim was all right. However, before Lena had a chance to assign the victim a number, the deputy sheriff and prosecuting attorney entered the scene with a search warrant and warrant of arrest in connection with another charge against her that had occurred 12 days earlier on February 15th. So as evidence, police seized a knitting needle wrapped in a wet wash rag, a large white wash bowl, quote, with the fluid content thereof, and a record book or diary that Lena was holding in her hands at the time. The police had the victim visit a Dr. Wolf of Homedale, so an actual medical doctor, for an examination, but soon both the victim and the accomplice returned to Boise. After returning to Boise, the victim became ill and was taken to the hospital, and after being attended to by a Dr. Goodmanson, the doctor found that she was, quote, in a state of inevitable abortion. So when questioned, Pig and Lucart both state that they went to Lena specifically because she could provide an abortion, but Lena says that she wasn't sure why they had come to her. She admitted that she had made an examination of the victim, but could not determine whether or not the victim was pregnant. Now, we don't have much information on the first trial. It took place in Murphy, Idaho, which was the county seat of Owyhee County, and Lena pled not guilty to her charge of procurement for an abortion. The diary was used as evidence looking specifically at the code names, identifying details and adjectives, and then within the diary, there was a loose letter dated February 24th, 1952, and it says, quote, Mrs. Lena Proud, you asked me to let you know how I am. You gave me the number Fresno 62. I have trouble from the abortion and want my money back immediately. And it is signed with what we think might be the woman's real name. So Lena was asked about this letter on the stand and said that the letter writer had come to her home when Lena was working on one of her astrological charts. So there's a question and answer. So question, getting back to this letter you received from this lady here, what did you think about it when you got that? answer. I wondered about it. I didn't know what to think. I can remember the woman coming in there and looking at that chart and talking about that number all right. Question. You remember this woman coming in and looking at the chart? Answer. Yes, but she was under a different name than that. Question. Did she pay you any money? Answer. She didn't give me any money. I didn't do anything for her. We had a little controversy. Question. Over what? Answer. She wanted me to do something for her, but I don't know for sure what she wanted. She wanted to know if I couldn't help her. She was leaving her husband and wanted to know if there was a place in Weezer. Question. Help her in what way? Answer. I don't know. She must have wanted an abortion. I couldn't understand it any other way. Question. She asked you. Answer. Yes, if I knew how. Question. What did you tell her? Answer. Told her I didn't. My hands were so weak that I couldn't if I tried. So, as I, you know, as I mentioned, the evidence that had been taken, the knitting needles and the wash bowl were used in evidence as well. There were 16 witnesses called in the two-day trial. So, it was a short trial, but a lot sort of packed in. Then, on June 11th, 1952, a 12-man jury, they deliberated for only two hours and found Lena guilty. She was sentenced to five years in prison, but was granted a $5,000 bond for release because her lawyers immediately filed for an appeal of her conviction. And so the main argument of the appeal was that the evidence the police seized was in relation to the incident with Pig and Lucart, but the search and arrest warrant was for the incident on February 15th. They said that the testimony of the accomplice should not have been included without corroboration with the victim or other evidence. Her lawyers argued that if the victim's testimony could not be included without corroborating evidence, then neither should the accomplice's. Because the accomplice was the one who really gave the most evidence, I think, probably because she was not under the, the operation. Mm -hmm. 
The diary, they said the diary should not have been admitted as evidence because there were no entries made related to the victim or connecting Lena to the victim, um, that it had no, quote, legitimate tendency, mm-hmm. I think, because it was just what seemed like just a bunch of scribbles. Right. The lawyers also said there was an error in the court admitting an answer that Lena gave on cross-examination, saying that it concerned a collateral matter. On direct questioning, she had said that her hands were too weak to be able to perform an abortion, like overall. But then on cross-examination, she admitted that she hadn't performed an abortion within three years. And so the lawyer tried to say, like, that's a completely different time. You can't bring that up as evidence in court. She's talking about something that happened three years ago. It has nothing to do with this case. So they argued that. And then there was also an event during the trial where one of the defense's witnesses was found guilty of contempt of court and dismissed by the judge. I couldn't, I wanted to find so badly what this was, but there weren't any like trial transcripts that I could find or any mention of it in the newspapers. It was just in this appeal. And so the lawyers argued that it was a pre-judicial error because it prejudiced the jury against Lena that, you know, he was her witness and he, it sounded like he talked back to the judge yeah. and said something like offensive to the judge and so then was like kicked out and that you know kind of is like oh she's associating with those kind of people <laughs> during the course of this witness's normal testimony something happened that just really riled him up and he quote insulted the court and was almost quite literally thrown out so you know that's not fair either on november 15th 1953 the court came back with their decision the lawyers had also argued against the letter that they said quote the evidence herein by way of a letter contained as a purported part of the state's exhibit two claiming an abortion at some unknown time and place by a third party is not admissible to motive or intent and such a letter was pure hearsay evidence but they also said that the court exercised correct authority in punishing that witness in the way that they did. They also said that the testimony of the victim alone would have been enough to convict Lena of procurement for an abortion, and thus the testimony of the accomplice was allowed. And then the circumstantial evidence of the diary was also found admissible. Therefore, Lena's guilty verdict was upheld and her five-year sentence remained. So Lena Pink Proud entered the Idaho State Penitentiary on December 4th, 1953. So her statistics are pretty slight. Procurement of abortion is her crime. Plea not guilty. Sentence five years. Jurisdiction was Owyhee County. Received on December 4th, 1953. She was 65 years old, born in California. Her occupation was a housewife. She was five feet zero inches tall and 132 pounds. So just a pretty, pretty slight woman. Medium complexion, hair color gray, eye color brown. Her Bertillion has a few more interesting details. She has a full set of false teeth, which we already know. She is quite hard of hearing. She has a six inch scar just underneath the crease of her right elbow from the accident with the mower that her sister mentioned. So that's her essentially sacrificing herself to save this child. The right ring and little fingers are crooked from the same accident. She had a five inch operation scar on her stomach. Her right leg is about half an inch shorter than her left foot from the car accident mentioned earlier. All joints on both of her hands slightly enlarged, all 10 fingers more or less stiff, and knuckles on her left index and middle fingers are swollen and probably caused from a heart ailment. Mm -hmm. The judge said upon her intake, quote, the above defendant had the reputation of running an abortion mill at Homedale for a number of years, getting patrons from all over South Idaho and Eastern Oregon. She did a cut rate business. The authorities have been after her for some years, but this is the first time that they would get enough evidence to go to court. If she had a clever lawyer in her trial court, she might have gotten away this time, which is an insult to injury. Anyway, back to the quote. There was no question of her guilt. The only question was proof of the instant offense. I do not think she is entitled to any sympathy or consideration. There is no way of telling how many women she ruined by her method of operation or how many she indirectly murdered by her unsanitary methods. She should be made an example of as a warning for such operations. There was an admission summary. Quote, Prognosis is considered rather poor. It is thought that she would probably continue her activity as before if she has the opportunity to do so at all. Also, she may honestly have the idea that she is doing a lot of good by her activity, that she is helping a lot of girls who might otherwise kill themselves, etc. Which I think she was, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but it's, you know, it is illegal and for some people morally wrong and so you know it's it's definitely a tough situation 
So while Lena was incarcerated, the Board of Corrections received two letters discussing Lena's personality. So one said, quote, I am writing in regards to Mrs. Lena Proud, as I think a great injustice has been done to her. For I know to me and to many, she has been a woman who has helped anyone in need and a good citizen. She has done so much for me that it would take more than a lifetime to repay her. She took me into her home when I was sick and unable to work. She paid my doctor bills and also dentist bills for a year. Not only did she do this, but give me the love of a mother, and for that, I can only think of her as a mother to me. In that time I was with her, there was not one person who came to borrow something, food or clothing, that she would turn away empty-handed. And as I heard about word getting around, I know if any person needed a babysitter or anything to borrow, someone would go ask Lena. Of course, some of these were not her friends, but again, Lena would not turn them down. I would like to think that by writing you, I may be helping Lena proud in some way. So, yeah. And, you know, the second letter read much of the same that she was always helping people Mm -hmm. in need. And the second letter also said that Lena's daughter needed Lena, especially because the girl was only 14 years old. And, you know, one of the lines in there says, um, if any girl needed a mother, it is this, you know, the girl at this age. Her sister, Ruby, wrote and compared Lena to Jesus being prosecuted by Pontius Pilate, which is a bit, it's a bit much, but, (laughs) but again, I think the feeling is that she was a woman who was so willing to help anyone who needed it, and which also may lend to some credence of the, you know, the reasoning she had in trying to help women, you know, obtain abortions. And again, whether it's morally correct or not, that's not our job to say, but she, I think she really did think that she was helping people who came to her yeah. asking for help. In the prison, Lena was not able to do much work at all. She originally had attempted some sewing, but had to stop even that because of her health. She had a heart ailment and was receiving medication for it from the prison physician, but the matron recommended that she be released as her conduct had been good, but also because her health had so greatly deteriorated since arriving. In the last part of August 1954, a petition arrived signed by numerous residents of Homedale saying that there was a favorable community attitude to having Lena return to Homedale because she did so much to help people, regardless of this abortion charge. You know, like they said, she was willing to give food and clothing. She paid doctor's bills. Everyone liked her. She just, she was there to help people. Mm -hmm. The Board of Corrections thought that her prognosis, that summary that, you know, she probably would do it when she got out, that that really hadn't changed much. But the only thing that may have changed is that her ailing health may have kept her from continuing, quote, her helpful activity. There was no real indication of a change in attitude. Again, she just thought she was doing good. She planned to return to her husband and her daughter in Homedale, which the Board of Corrections apparently found acceptable, and she was released from the Idaho State Penitentiary on November 1st, 1954, on parole. Wow. She served 10 months and 29 days of a five-year sentence for wow. procurement for an abortion. And then a final release from parole came a year later on October 31st, 1955. Within the next decade, Lena's health continued to deteriorate. Jesse, her husband, actually died on April 27th, 1961, so only about five years after she was fully released. And then Lena's heart disease continued to get worse. On July 8th, 1967, Lena entered a Caldwell hospital for abdominal adhesions. And then on July 12th, four days later, Lena passed away from intestinal obstruction from the complications of those abdominal adhesions. The doctor wrote, you know, there was there was a question on the death certificate, any underlying conditions, and he said, con, you know, congenital heart disease. And so she didn't die from heart complications, but she was continually getting worse. So she was actually almost 80 years old wow. when she died, 79 years old. Upon her death, she was survived by her three daughters, a brother, four sisters, nine grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. And she is buried in the Marsing Homedale Cemetery in Marsing, Idaho. So that is, actually, I think she's our only woman in for a procurement for an abortion and Uh actually, I believe, tied for our oldest female inmate at 65 years old, number 8760, Lena Pink Proud. Nice work. Yeah, it's... She's got such a fascinating story. Mm-hmm. I love the the charts that she was mm-hmm. making. They're super fascinating. And then she has all these Bible quotes mm-hmm. in there as well. Mm-hmm. And all of them are saying like, astrologers 
were written about mm. positively right. in the Bible that what I'm doing is not yeah. against the church, right. which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, because most churches think that astrology is a is a thing of the devil, basically. Yeah. And that was, I kind of fe- always had that feeling growing up. Like I always thought I wasn't right. supposed to know about kind it. Kind of a cult, like yeah, witchcraft Yeah, totally. Almost. Yeah. But again, I am a cancer through and through. So I <laughs> guess I believe in it a little bit. <laughs> and we actually still have the artifacts, the exhibits, mm-hmm. the state exhibits, the wash bowl. I haven't seen them yet. And I, I really want to. I took the photos that are in our book. Oh, so okay. I got to actually handle them. So when you were talking about it, it just brought back the visceral nature of like bringing this wash bowl over and, mm-hmm. and the rag and, mm-hmm. you know, the knitting needles. And it really brought this story to life. Mm-hmm. I bet. Knowing that those are there. And yeah, you can see photos of those artifacts in the book. So in the book. Still, I'm trying to sling these books. You guys should order one. It's great. Numbered. <laughs> can buy it on the website. Yes. Well, wow. that that is season three. Season Anthony. three is up. How, that was how, how do you so feel? Fun. You know, it was a lot of interesting things going on around us. Yes. But it took me away from our current reality. Absolutely. So I'm I was happy to to tell stories like this. Me and I too. hope I hope you listeners, you know, it took you away for a while. Yes, and... <laughs> absolutely. I again I just continue to hope that people find these as interesting as we do. Yeah. You know, these are just people from middle of nowhere idaho but i think that they're they're so fascinating and they teach us a lot about what was happening in the world more broadly and and sort of the nature of how crime has changed and how crime hasn't changed right well everybody we've got uh one more stool pigeon saturday for you so stick around for that but we're gonna take a brief break We've got another exciting season coming for you later this summer. All right, everybody, do your own time. Do your own number. We will talk to you soon. (laughs) If you enjoyed Behind Gray Walls, please rate, review, and subscribe so others can find our podcast. If you're interested in more Old Idaho Penitentiary information and to see mugshots of the inmates featured in this episode, Follow the Old Idaho Penitentiary on Instagram and Facebook. If you want to learn more about the Idaho State Historical Society and its other sites, follow ID State Historical Society on Instagram or visit history.idaho.gov. If you have a question or comment for the hosts, please email us at behindgraywalls at gmail.com.